Central. You know how fast you're going? What? How fast you're going? I don't know. Ten? Eight. Be advised, this is an explicit podcast. If you're easily offended, get your panties twisted into a knot. Leave now. Run to your safe space. Get your little cloth for your tears. All the opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the host and his guest and do not reflect the opinions of any local or government agency. Welcome to Motor Cop Chronicles Podcast. I'm your host, Iceman. Uh, Duke the Dog's already bothering me, everybody. Uh, we're going to have a guest today, so I'm going to run through the housekeeping real quick. Y'all hear him? If you uh, want a great cigar, go to mypatriotcigar.com. Use promo code MOTORCOP15. You will get 15% off of your order. If it's $100 more, you get free shipping. It's a... Uh, uh, Local, not local here, but it's an American-owned company, uh, a Patriot, and uh, you'll be supporting them also in their awesome cigars. Uh, if you want any merch from uh, the Motor Cop Chronicles podcast, you can go to the website, motorcopchronicles.com. Click on the link. It'll bring you to the Etsy store, or you can go to the store itself. T-shirts, other stuff. Price as uh, low as I can do it. Not trying to make no money, just trying to get my brand out there. If you want extra Motor Cop Chronicles podcast, pictures, videos, text, all that stuff, you can join the Patreon. They got a seven-day free trial. If you don't like it, you can opt out. I understand times are tight. Still putting out the free stuff. Speaking of them, I got my full crew members. We got Jared, uh, for another uh, motorcycle cop. Uh, we got Mr. John Demink. We got Dan Cross with Burley Boards. We got T Bird. We got Mr. Jim Procrant from Short Track uh, Short Track Guys Podcast. We got truck driving friend Mr. Hoppy Hoppison. We got Mr. Blake Walker, AA Ron from the I Had to Say It Podcast. Mr. Z Palmer. We have Roy Spalding. It's Roy with the S, not the P. Our favorite girl from down under, JoJo. Of course, we have Kaylee Norris and Natasha A. from the great state of Washington. And our OG Patreon, Melissa Holstein. So, I'm going to introduce this guest. Hope I do him credit. Uh, I'm real happy when it came on. I've listened to him, listened to his podcast. He's on some other ones. i uh, seen him on TV. Uh, he's uh, the founder and CEO of the Wounded Blue also host of the Wounded Blue podcast. He's written four books that I know of. Uh, he was on three seasons of Cops. Uh, and he sings also. Retired after 34 years in law enforcement. It's my pleasure to introduce you, uh, Mr. Randy Sutton. How you doing, sir? I'm doing fantastic. I appreciate that. And I actually have a new book coming out in a couple months called Rescuing 911, The Fight. For America's safety, and it's all about where we are and how we got here and what we got to do to get the hell out of it. Definitely have to get it. Don't you have? Uh, I believe. Uh, don't you have like a? It's like a documentary type movie thing you got out too, right? I do I have a documentary film called The Wounded Blue. It's all about our organization, our charity that uh, we've uh, been operating for almost five years and helped more than uh, fourteen thousand police officers that have been injured either physically or emotionally and psychologically. And um, we, uh, we're doing some amazing work in the Wounded Blue. Uh, the um, documentary film is available on Amazon.com. I urge your viewers, your listeners to go to Amazon.com, put in the Wounded Blue and find out what this organization does. And if you can, hit that donate button and give 10 bucks a month and help a hero. Yes. Go help the uh, wounded police officers because... As y'all know, I've talked about stories before. Uh, some of these agencies, once these officers get hurt and after their uh, the, so much time in uh, workman's comp runs out, they'll let them go. And they got hurt, hurt, Absolutely. hurt on duty. Hurt on duty, and it's just like they kick them out the door. 
Oh, you're you're absolutely right. The, the, it's it's absolutely shameful the way uh, uh, many of our police officers are being treated once they sacrifice so much for their communities and their departments. I, I mean, I can give you my example is uh, you know, I did 34 years as a cop total. I did 10 in the state of New Jersey and then got bored because I was a small town cop and joined the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department and did 24 years with Metro and retiring as a lieutenant. Oh, I didn't intend to retire. Um, what happened was I had a stroke in my police car and that's what ended my police career. And then my own department turned its back on me and said, we're not paying your medical bills. And uh, even though they were legally obligated to do so, as they knew, um, but they played the game, um, forced me to get an attorney, forced me to go to court, um, took over a year, and they were banking on, on, uh, on being hopeful that I would die in the meantime. Um, but I, I fooled them. I, won, I, I, I survived, I won, and now they, of course, they have to give me my benefits. But being treated like that was a, was a, a, a terribly eye-opening and disappointing experience. And that's when I began to start realizing that this is the plight of many officers throughout our nation. And, uh, you know, the, the, the stories of cops getting shot and then being thrown away, uh, they're, they're, they're literally, ha it's happening every day. So we, we're fighting. We're fighting the good fight. Um, I have an incredible team of people behind me that uh, everybody on my team is a cop who's been shot, stabbed, beaten, run over, screwed up, screwed over, and yet continues to serve. And we're all over the country. So I urge any officer who is struggling either because of being physically injured or all of the, the post-traumatic stress injury that affects many of us, reach out to the Wounded Blue. We're completely confidential. We're uh, brother versus brother and sister. Uh, we're the Blue family that you were promised, but uh, doesn't really exist, but it exists with us. I did an episode, I don't know, a while back called The Paper Thin Line. Because yeah, I, yeah, right. I've been through some stuff. I haven't talked about it on here yet because I'm still active duty. But I've been through some stuff. But I try to stress on these younger uh, officers and stuff. I'm like, because I got sucked into it too. That uh, don't don't uh, I won't put it. Don't neglect your family and stuff like that. Uh, you have to have your life away from your your job is not who you are. It's what you do. Exactly. So when you and, can't uh, do you know, it no more. Right. Well, we actually are holding in September our third annual National Law Enforcement Survival Summit that talks about all of these issues, how to survive your career, um, and not just physically and not just tactically, but emotionally, psychologically, relationships, fiscally. It's, a, it's, a, it's probably... If you have one training conference to go to as a cop, this is the one you want to go to. Colonel, Colonel Dave Grossman is uh, speaking. Dave and Bessie Smith will be there. I've got the A-list of uh, presenters, and um, you get to interact with your brothers and sisters. Plus, we also we, we don't have a conference unless we have fun. So we've got a comedy show, and then we've got an, an eight, the biggest, best ACDC tribute band in the nation is going to come pay a visit and we're going to have a, co a concert as well. So, um, go to the wounded blue.org, look at the survival summit, just scroll down. You'll see it. And it's only 295 bucks. Hotel is cheap. They're given a special rate for the, for uh, participants. Um, it's at a really cool hotel in Vegas, September 26th to the 29th. So, uh, it's not just for active duty. It's also for guys who have been cops and have left the profession for a variety of reasons. So we also encourage to bring your wife or, or husband, your spouse, or a significant other, and, uh, and come and enjoy four days of the best law enforcement-related training you'll ever find. Sounds fun. Might be something on my bucket list coming up. <laughs> My retirement. Yep. Uh, yep. You, you, should, you, should, you should, as soon as we hang up, you should get on my website and reserve a spot for the survival summit. Sounds good. Uh, I did not know that that you you were a singer. 
That what? That you sang, that you were a singer. Yeah, I've uh, I've actually um, I've done quite a bit of uh, of uh, singing. Uh, I I like the, the old the old music that you know, like Frank Sinatra did. I say you like and, Randy uh, Sinatra from what I listen I'm, to. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, if you go to my website, Randy Sutton Speaks dot com, I have a full album on there. Randy Sutton Speaks dot com. That's where I listen to it. I was like, did you? Well, I was like, damn. <laughs> I, I said, I didn't know Randy song songs. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I don't advertise it all that much, but um, I still uh, I still get up there in a in a, a lounge or two in Las Vegas and and uh, do a few do a few sets. So yeah, that's he, part, he of, multi- part of what I do for fun. Multi talented because he writes books, he sings, he's been uh, in movies. I seen that you were in Casino uh, and several other movies. Uh, true, true story. Yep. <laughs> so I was like, I was like, you've been on like I said, you were. On cops for quite a, quite a bit. I mean, you were a fair amount younger back then, but <laughs> <laughs> you can say that because <laughs> I watched I watched the clip. I was like, I know you never seen me, but I, I've seen you on TV and all stuff. I was like, damn, look how young Randy was. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's when I had a, a lot more hair and it was a lot darker. Yeah, uh, I hope. Uh, from one of the things, I know you were involved in a shooting. From what I watched, then. Uh, I hope you never had to test to find out if the forty-five had better stopping power than nine millimeter. Well, as a matter of fact, I did. Um, I uh, I've been in I've been in four shootings, and uh, throughout my career. In fact, just before I retired um, as a lieutenant, I was involved in a fatal shooting uh, just uh, just prior to my retirement. Mm. Um, so there's uh, there's been. Uh, I, I faced the dragon a number of times. Uh, happy to say, I have survived every single one of them, um, which is something I can point out that those that came up against me did not, and uh, and that's one of those life changing experiences. Um, I can I can tell you this that um, having been involved in these shootings, that um, it 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 always it always plays a role in your development as a human being. Um, there's also such, you know, we've all, we always hear about post-traumatic stress disorder, but I can tell you this, that there is also something called post-traumatic stress growth. And it isn't talked about enough, but it is as real as post-traumatic stress injury. You can, I fully believe that I became a better cop after my first shooting my first fatal shooting, excuse me, because I came to understand myself a lot better. And I came to understand what I, what I call the, the question of why. And the question of why is why I survived it, because this was, this was a toe-to-toe gunfight. Literally, our gun muzzles were just about touching. And uh, I was not wearing my body armor at the time. So the fact that I survived it is... Uh, an incredible, um, incredible story in and of itself, but the um, the realization and the reality of of the aftermath of that, I believe, gave me the opportunity to grow as a human being, and I was a better cop because of it. Oh, uh, well, good Lord was looking out for you, obviously. And the good Lord was looking out for me. That <laughs> uh, that angel that that angel has been on my shoulder my entire career was with me again that night i fully believe that too well i'm fortunate enough where i haven't been in four i was involved in uh one officer involved well a shooting incident on duty uh a a very long time ago uh during a swat team uh operation going on i was a shield guy first in the house but so getting shot at and all that stuff like that uh and you find out you find out who, who who's gonna uh, who whose training kicks in and who's gonna run real quick it's, when you when you work when you're working with yeah. people because they had yep, a, sure. <laughs> they had a couple guys that you would have never thought I'd have never thought in my life that that didn't uh, respond and act the way you would have thought they would have responded and acted in that situation and you find out how you're gonna respond and act too because uh, I don't know. 
I believe most cops probably like I said, I've run I've run through so many scenarios in my head just driving around patrolling, saying, Okay, if this happens I'm gonna do this. If this I'm constantly doing I still do that today, almost thirty years later and uh it's like I said, it does change you. Uh I've been in uh three motorcycle crashes and I'm still a motorcycle cop and I've been uh I'm one of the lucky ones that I've I've only broken minor stuff and basically walked away from three of them. And I've had a lot of friends that got in motorcycle crashes. And some of them wasn't as bad as mine and, and didn't make it through it. So Yeah, it's, um, well, there's only, there's only two kinds of motor officers. Those that have gone down and those that will go down. Yes, we, so. tell, them that, we tell them that first day of school. <laughs> and we also were like, look, you, you, you know, uh, Guys, I used, was a sergeant over motor division, my old department. And, uh, we would tell them if you have a wife, you know, make sure she's okay with it. And we need her phone number. And they're like, for what? And it's like, because so, when you crash, we have to call her if you're not able to. Yeah, so, that's right. And they for sure. Because I said, we all exchange them numbers for the simple reason because uh, most motor cops are, you know, pretty much we're close we're a close-knit community and i would rather my wife get a call and call from somebody she knows than somebody she's never met before absolutely 100 percent. so like i said i saw you on cops I said, you've you've had a tremendous career i uh, read that you were the most one of the most highly decorated officers ever at metropolitan las vegas that's true. Over That's there. true. I, uh, so, I mean, I, I, I had, I did have a great career. Um, one that I'm very proud of. Um, I have, uh, I, I've had some experiences that will stay with me the rest of my life. And that's as it should be when, when, you know, you've spent as much time in the saddle as I have, um, uh, you know, in a patrol car. Oh, yeah. uh, so I'm, I, I fully believe this, that, that, there is no more noble profession than that of being a police officer. Um, and, and even today um, amongst all the, the negative stuff that's going on and the, you know, this, all of the defunding insanity and the, the politics, when it comes down to it, the American police officer is a hero, a hero for even putting on that uniform and going out onto the street because you are always, always a target. You are always in danger. And you, as a police officer, have the ability to change lives. You have the ability to save lives. And so many of these men and women out there that are out there literally doing the job every single day are true American heroes. And uh, they need to be treated just like that. I, mean, I was told, well, like I said, I'm about two years out from retirement. And I'll have my 30 hard flat is a street well i i was a sergeant at one time i passed two lieutenant spots up because i didn't want to leave motor but you know i'm not i, I switched departments and started back at the bottom and decided i just to stay a, a beat cop on a, a motorcycle cop but uh it's like so i've been a street cop for 30 years and uh I'm right at it now it's like you know if i just feel like i helped one person out of all the times you know you know it would it'd be worth it to me because uh with the, these kids coming up today it's a different world out there everybody asks me now they're like say man you, you're gonna do that drop program which people know i have to work an extra three years i get a nice put very nice sum of money lump sum besides my full retirement i'm like uh i don't think so they're like you're just gonna walk away it's several hundred thousand dollars i'm like uh they said you're just gonna walk away from that and i'm like uh, i said i'm a dinosaur I said, I'm a dinosaur cop, and I'm scared. It, it worries. I don't scare me, but it worries me that uh, I'm going to end up as a CNN article for doing my job correctly. And it's just yeah. like, it's like, it's like I, 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 I'm, I'm used to policing differently. I know how to police today, but I was that's not how I, I'm used to doing it. So in, I don't want to have, you know, one thing millimeters second of a hesitation because i gotta think to do something different can cost you or somebody else their life and i, I don't want to do that well that's a that's a real that's a real worry now i mean the unfortunate reality is that the world of policing has dramatically shifted and um there are more threats not just physical 
but political that that cops have never had to really really worry about on the scale that they do now and i mean now 15 seconds of a, of a videotape of you fighting a suspect that you would le- legitimately use force can literally start riots yes and wind up with you getting terminated by by a spineless police leader so yeah these are these are re- very very real well it's just like uh you've probably seen it uh the i forget which state it was recent his most recent one uh they had a uh chase involving an 18 wheeler for 30 something miles they end up spiking 18 wheeler the guy gets out he's he's they say you know the the pd department released the dog and it, the state troopers like don't they say he was hollering but he wasn't hollering but anyway the guy bad guy had his hands up but he wasn't listening to commands Release his dog. Guy got guy gets bit. They done fired the guy already. Of course, I think he's going to get his job back because his own department said, according to their departmental policy, he did not violate any any SOPs on use of force or anything. He did what he's supposed to do. But because you know, basically, he got fired for because everybody was griping about it. Yeah, there. Well, that's that's happening in departments across the country. Um, you have spineless police leadership. You have uh, political interference uh, from the city councils and the mayors. And who do they take it out on? They take it out on the, the guy doing the job, the guy who literally putting it on the line. Yeah, throw you under the bus in a heartbeat. <laughs> in a, it, literally in a heartbeat. So, yeah, that's one of the things we deal with with the Wounded Blue, that abandonment, that feeling of abandonment. <clears throat> I mean, I, I, uh, it, it, it's very real. Sometimes... I mean, it's like when you get hurt on the job. It's it may not be the physical injury that that gets you. It may be the way you are treated after the physical injury when that suddenly becomes the post traumatic stress injury that can be career ending as well. Right. Well, it's like with me. I keep having to tell myself so we get close to that point. So I'll do the episode on it. Is like, uh, how do you turn it off? How am I supposed to? turn off being a cop when that's you know the majority of my life i've been a cop and once i retire i'm a civilian and i like, how do you turn it off because uh i'm coming up on that part and at one point when i separated from my other department before i went to the other department there was a couple weeks there that you know i wasn't a cop no more and i'm like what what the hell am i gonna do i was like because i didn't know how to, i don't really you know i've been doing it for 23 years at that point and i was like I really don't know how to do too much of anything else, <laughs> you know. And then, of course, I got, I mean, it wasn't two weeks and I was hired up. You know, my old department asked me to come back three times. But uh, it's like, but I felt that for just, it wasn't for a long period, but I felt that separation like I had been, a, I was abandoned and thrown out. It's like, it's almost like I went through like a, a death or something like that, even though I hadn't. Well, you know, I, I mean, I went through something similar, right? When I had the stroke, that was career ending for me. And uh, three weeks before I had the stroke, my mother died in my arms. Two months before that, I was in the fatal shooting. And suddenly, uh, I'm, I'm, my whole identity is gone from, from, from you know, the stroke. And it was, I was like cast adrift and it was... It was a very difficult transition. I wasn't ready for it. Um, you know, when you're retiring, you you can prepare yourself. When you get hurt and suddenly your 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 job is taken from you, it can really affect you psychologically. And uh, I mean, I went through some struggles, no doubt about it. Well, looks like you come out well on the other end. <laughs> well, actually, I I think that it was meant. I was meant to walk this path. You know, I don't believe in coincidences. I believe that we're given a path to walk, and we're led to that path if we open our eyes and we allow it to play out before us. Because you're very much more articulate, able to write books and stuff than I am. Uh, usually, like I uh, my I don't, I'm, I'm, like I said, I know you're extremely busy, and I'm more than you know grateful for you coming on to my little podcast, but. It's like I'm usually the. We're gonna to get to some funny stories in a minute, people. <laughs> they, uh, 
<laughs> I'm more the funny guy that has uh, the reason I never got past the sergeant is because of my mouth. And I'm not going to lie about it. I mean, I'm not stupid. I know. I, I like uh, <laughs> back in the day, he used to make me mad. But I'm old now. I know because, you know, I'd be on a call and I'm just type, you know, that might snap off at me and I'd snap right back at him, you know, or. You know, I'm, I'm just, just, I've always been a smart ass my entire life. And, you know, I was, this one didn't call and complain, Randy, but <laughs> think about it. If I, yeah, I, you were Molly did it. You know, this lady sitting there and she's like, well, somebody come into my house and they, they stole my softball bat and, and my diet pills. And I was like, well, they wasn't working. So how much was the bat <laughs> work? And it's just like, excuse me. I'm like, nothing, you know, <laughs> but it's like stuff with, I, I was like diarrhea to mouth. I've, Learn to control it a lot more now. Uh, I still will pop off to people, uh, which, you know, uh, <laughs> I had one not long ago. To, we had a, a weather-related incident down here, and I was in this road for 12 hours straight directing traffic. In, I'm in Louisiana, in Louisiana heat, uh, which is can be totally miserable if you're not <laughs> – if you don't know what I'm talking about. And uh, – some people messed with, with doing stuff. I, I, so I, I, I got, uh, I had some words with a DOTD worker. I'm, I'm, since you're on here, I'm be respectful. I, I told him I was going to do something with that shovel he was holding. If he side eyed me again like that, <laughs> mm-hmm. then uh, somebody else come along and I punished them and made them park in the parking lot for 15 minutes for messing my traffic. And the major asked me about it. And I said, well, was it that DOTD worker? Oh, he's like, uh, no. I said, was the guy I punished? And he's like, well, yeah. And I was like, he's like, look, I just want to let you know, I know you were having a bad day that day. <laughs> so I was like, it's like, yeah, so I, I know what kept me from, because they, they got a guy I trained. He, uh, I actually was his F- FTO for his whole entire time. He's a major, you know, <coughs> a warden of the jail. Uh, another guy used to ride with me. Uh, his dad was my supervisor. He's gone. He was in high school, and I would just, like I said, back in the early 90s, I'd sneak over and pick him up on the weekends, and he'd ride with me on the weekend. Before he when he was still in high school, you know he's a captain over a whole uniform patrol division now. So <laughs> it's like I obviously I did something right. I trained another guy. He's a lieutenant with the state police. I said obviously I did good for other people, just not myself. <laughs> well, listen, it, there's it ain't nothing wrong with being a road cop. That's where the rubber meets the road. Oh yeah, I'm being big grinding. I told everybody, you know, people that's like yeah. I was offered detective a few times and stuff, and I, I passed it up a lieutenant's job. I passed up it. I said I was going to retire off a motorcycle. Well, I got two more years to make it, and hopefully I'll retire off a motorcycle. <laughs> Be crazy. Good, good, good. So, working in Vegas. I've never been to Vegas myself. Uh, they had to be some crazy stuff happening out there. Oh, well, let me tell you, from going from a small-town police officer to going to Vegas – was was an absolute the world was different here and uh yeah there was some i, I mean some of the funniest stuff uh I, when i when I, I worked vice for a short period of time and i gotta tell you some of the funniest stories come out of working vice in vegas um because most people think that prostitution is legal here it's not it's legal in the state of nevada at at brothels out in counties with less than fifty thousand people but not in vegas Although you wouldn't really know that because they got billboards with people with that say girls direct to your room. And, and it's, it's, um, it's basically a wink and a nod. Everybody knows what's going on, but you know, this is, this is what people come to Vegas for. So, um, but working some of the, some of the vice capers, um, I was, I picked up this hooker and, uh, you know, there's microphones in your, in your, in your unmarked car. And you're supposed, and you have a backup that's watching you. And when you make the arrest for the soliciting, then your backup is supposed to come, goes to come scoop them up. Well, I they they were using me, they were using me, and there the, uh, there was a, a male hooker on the corner, and and I and I was in a convertible car, no shirt on, and a cowboy hat. <laughs> you were, <laughs> and and they were using me for for what we called fruit bait back then. I, I guess that was politically <laughs> incorrect now. But you had you had <laughs> no shirt on and a cowboy hat. And I had no shirt on and a cowboy okay. hat. And and I, I cruised up to where this guy was and 
he he kind of gave me the nod and jumped in the car and i went around the corner and he uh he, he solicited me for a sex act for 25 bucks and i'm hitting the the brake lights to notify my and of course they're listening to the conversation and i'm giving them the signal to come bust this guy out and they decided that this was too funny that this guy's like dive bombing me trying to grab my crotch <laughs> and and they're just laughing their butts off watching from afar until finally I said, Hey, 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 listen, I'm a cop and you're under arrest. And then he, the dude started crying. <laughs> it was like, Oh my God. So I didn't I didn't get a lot of satisfaction from that job, but it was some funny stuff that took place. And they did that to you if I was <laughs> Oh, absolutely, hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean a lot of like I said I know I Said something, somebody, somebody said something. I said, prostitution is not legal in Vegas. I said, they have, you know, these, like the Pussycat Ranch and places like that. I said, but. They have, yeah, they have the brothels out in, in, in uh, rural counties where it is legal. But yeah, but it has to be in the, in the, in the brothel, not on the, not out on the street. And from what I saw, I, I watched some of that uh, show on, uh, was that uh, HBO a long time ago? They had one or something. Yeah, yeah, they sure did. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, it looks like you needed to, if you didn't have a whole lot of money, you'd have to take out a small loan to be able to do that because it's not like you know it was cheap. Oh no, it's not. It ain't. It ain't cheap. It ain't cheap at all. Um, from what I hear, of course. <laughs> well, like I said, mine's from watching it. I mean, it was like I was like, my God. It was well. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna confess to anything, but um, it's about three hundred fifty bucks back then. <laughs> yeah, from what I saw on TV, it was like they were charging like twelve, thirteen hundred dollars. Like, yeah, that's right. I'm sure. I'm sure that's what it is now. But a lot of time has gone by <laughs> since since I paid a visit. Oh, I can imagine. Uh, so I'm sure y'all have to deal with. Uh, you had to deal with a shit ton of just like basically drunk and disorderly in the streets and stuff like that. Or, oh yeah, I mean this is uh, you you're when you're when you're a patrol cop here in Vegas, you don't get any rest. You're going from call to call to call to call to call. You're ra- rarely are you not rarely are you not on an assigned call. Um, so it's very very busy. If it all depends on what area of town you're in. You know, there's a lot of uh, just residential areas. Um, and then, you know, there's of course the strip and they're all there here. We were combined sheriff's department and police department. So, um, they, the department, in fact, this is the 50th anniversary of the metropolitan police that, uh, the Clark County Sheriff's department and Las Vegas city police joined together in 1972. And so, uh, this is the 50th anniversary and it's, uh, it's it's um, it's it's very it's interesting to have both county wide and city wide uh, police powers, but it's it's very efficient. It's a good way to go. So that y'all are working in like together in the same area with the sheriff's office in the police department, or it's all just combined. Well, the, the sheriff's office is the police department. Okay, so but y'all are. You, did y'all have an elected sheriff? You're, you're both. You're both. A, you're both a, a deputy sheriff and a police officer. Both. Yeah, okay. Like dual commission. I got you. Yeah. So, well, it just seems like I mean, it had to be a, a ginormous department because it seems like just the street. Like I said, I've never been there, but the it's the amount of people that are there, just like a uh, tourist or whatever, ought to be just crazy. Oh yeah, there's there's over fifty million people come here each year. So yeah, it's a it's a it's a very very fast paced life here, very fast paced life, very fast paced police department, uh, one of the best trained police departments in the country, and uh, stole a lot of pride a lot of pride being a cop here. So how was it with working with like with the cops people when they were following you around? I know. Oh, was- uh, it was you know very easy. All they did was throw a cameraman and a sound man in the patrol car with you, and whatever you did, you did. Whatever they captured, they captured. Um, there was no, uh, you know, some people thought, well, you know, are you supposed to do something? They just, they just record you. That's all. And then if they, if you get into some good stuff, then, you know, it may make the show may not, uh, you know, it was one of the things that, that, uh, you, you never know what was going to, 
what they were going to actually like and not like. Because, you know, there's a lot of funny stuff that goes on, a lot of dramatic stuff that goes on. And they just happened to get a whole bunch of great stories with me um, because uh, I was a very active police officer. Uh, when they had, uh, what was it, that show? They had a show that came out, uh, I don't know how I many, it was quite a while back, but it was basically, uh, it was kind of like cops or live PD, but they followed like traffic cops around. I forget what it was called, but they would like, you know, follow traffic cops around while you made traffic stops and stuff. And, uh, I went to administration and asked them if I could get in contact with them, and they told me that I already got in enough trouble that they didn't need to. This was before body cams and all this stuff, of course. And they were like, they didn't need to see any more than they already knew about me. So. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Right, right. And I was the one always, uh, I actually, before, like I said, before body cams were ever thought of, I used to uh, carry a little tape recorder on a string that was around one of the landing around my neck and audio recorded a lot of my stuff because i got tired of getting called in and accused of do- saying stuff i wasn't even saying so i was basically oh, I was- ma- many of <laughs> many of us carried carried personal recorders with us we did that back in the back in the 90s we did that because to cover our own butts yeah absolutely yeah i used to do that uh uh, like I said, department I work for now is, uh, like I said, I'm South Louisiana. I don't work for a uh, department I left from was a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger than the one I'm with now. Uh, but neither one of the departments I was with, had, had we ever never used body cameras. Then my older department has in, uh, in dash cameras in cars, but I was on a motorcycle, so they had that. But uh, like I said, I still don't have a body camera. Uh, I use, right. uh, I right. actually bought these sunglasses that that video and audio in 1080. And when I get on calls, I record myself <laughs> just, yeah. just just to cover my butt. Right. No, I get it. I get it. Hey, uh, um, I have got um, uh, a conference call that I have to go on. So I'm going to have to cut this a little bit short, buddy. Well, I, I, it's good. I appreciate you coming on a hundred percent. Like I said, I'm a fan of yours. I'll just be honest. So <laughs> I'm just happy that you came on and spoke to me my, my pleasure my privilege and think about coming to the national law enforcement survival summit september 26th to the 29th in las vegas go to the woundedblue.org and sign up now all right thank you randy maybe we'll do another another time when you ain't busy you got it man all Will right. do. thank you take care well everybody that that was randy sutton uh unfortunately he had to go for a conference call i appreciate him uh, I didn't say it on while he was on here. He's the he on his podcast, The Wounded Blue. He does uh, whenever he puts out episodes. He does a, a end of wa- little end of watch thing. Is he's the one that got made me think of doing one at the end of every month. So uh, I hope y'all enjoyed it. Uh, Wednesday's coming up. I I think I'm gonna have everybody here. I'm not sure. Uh, so hopefully I will. If not, you'll get me in Holstera most likely. You know. Other than that, everybody stay safe. Uh, watch your back. Watch your partner's back. Remember, we're not sheepdogs. We are lions. And to always smile because the ice man could always be behind you. Because I don't give a fuck what you say. Yeah, I'm going to do shit my way. So you can go kick rocks, I'ma stack bricks up, build what I want to make. Yo, I got a lot of shit to say, so I'ma do this every day. I'll be writing things until...